Australia is often defined as the most successful multicultural country in the world. But what does that mean? Recent years saw a rise in a polarising debate, but also a louder call for harmony. This leads us to question, how do we want to be together? To explore this and other questions, we invited four high-profile Australians who advocate for social inclusion to express their views. Here are their stories. When we came here, we had a family of Maltese people who looked after us. So the government gave us a Maltese family to look after, and we didn't know it. They, you know, we couldn't speak Maltese, and they, you know, we just went to their house and they cooked for us, and we cooked for them. And you know, and and we we didn't know what to eat because you know, 1975 in Australia was no such thing as you know Vietnamese grocery shops, right? So my mum came back. We my mum went to the supermarket, right? And we'd never been in a supermarket before, right? So my mum came back supermarket first day with a box of cornflakes. Right? So the whole family we sat around a dinner table just going, oh, trying to work it out because you know we couldn't read it, you know, because it wasn't in Maltese, right? And it's a chicken on it. Right, cornflakes got a chicken on it, right? So my mum works it out. My mum, she's very smart, my mum. She worked it out. She goes, oh, ha, ha, okay, okay. Okay, I get it, okay. I'll get a piece of bread. I put some margarine on it. I put some cornflake on it. Some soy sauce. And send us off to school. I was born in South Sudan. I left South Sudan when I was about three months, moved to Kenya. And the reason why we moved to Kenya was because uh, my mom had a eye infection that the facilities back in, in, in the village in South Sudan could not really um, facilitate for. So we went over to Kenya. It took about nine years. Um, in Australia, people have this idea that you you are just, it's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory where you get given your golden ticket and you go to the, it's it's not like that. I think school for me was, um, was really cool because it just made, I was able to make friends, but I was also able to um, get, play sports and just be with friends and, and all of that. So yeah, um, my time in Perth was, was amazing. I came to Australia in 2001 as a refugee with my mom and sister. But I was born in Sierra Leone and my family uh, were being prosecuted, we were unsafe. So my family uh, fled Sierra Leone and we ended up in Gambia in an unofficial uh, refugee camp set up by the community. And we were there for a couple of years in limbo, not really sure where what life was going to look like. There was no guarantee guarantees for us. Um, and I just, just remembered not being able to play or hope for a future because it didn't look like that was a possibility. It was just every single day, you sort of took it by day and you sort of just took whatever opportunities came your way and you just lived in the moment because that's all that was guaranteed was the moment you had in front of you. I will never forget though the day they came to us and said, you're going to Australia. Australia has decided to take you in. When you have wanted something for so long, it's like, your heart stops <laughs> and you take a deep breath that you didn't know you were holding. And then after that initial response, we said, where the bloody hell is Australia? I was born and raised in rural Victoria, a town called Shepparton, um, by migrant parents. Um, my family migrated to Australia in 1970. Um, first came to Melbourne uh, from Turkey. I was an Aussie kid at school and then I was a Turkish kid at home. Growing my high school years were during the Say Sorry campaign. So I had a lot of exposure um, to real Australian history through um, not the official ways or the official channels, but Shepparton being the town that it is, I was able to sit down and listen to conversations with elders that it's just not things that you learn in the classroom. Um, because in the town, I guess the neighborhood that I grew up in, we were all very diverse so there was lots of migrants there there was lots of um, aboriginal families there there was lots of white australians as well um, and we all grew up together so we just had access to each other's elders i was doing wagarama i think we were in um wollongong okay 
So me and the, the indigenous actress, we after the show, we went to the bar and we we're just playing pinball, just to relax after the show. And this skinhead comes up to us, right? Like full on skinhead, skin on his head, white t-shirt, braces, you know, combat boots, the whole lot. He come up to us and we go, oh, here we go. And he was crying, right? He went, he, he actually went to the show and he was crying and he came up to us and he said, for 23 years of my life, I've been taught to hate you blokes. Now I know you're human. There are people who teach their children that Aboriginal people and Asian people and whoever is the different colour is not human. Can you believe this? My people and back in South Sudan, um, people had to flood war and conflict. And I always say, just put yourself in, in our shoes where something happened overnight in Australia and we have to pretty much leave with what we have on, what we've just woken up and we run away. And then we've become refugees of something else. The first time I experienced racism was when I was called a black monkey. And I couldn't actually understand what they were talking about. I had to ask my mom, what is this about? And she had to explain to me about racism at the age of 13, that the color of my skin was seen to be less than, made me less than, made me unworthy, made me dirty, made me uncivilized. Um, and that these people were looking at me in a particular way and treating me and looking down at me because of the color of my skin. I had escaped one form of insecurity to a war. Um, I have now entered a new form of insecurity, racism. Uh, it was after 9-11 that things changed, I think, for all of us um, as migrants, uh, in particular as Muslim migrants. Um, even though I was born there, all of a sudden I was not born there, if that makes sense. Um, and I wasn't a visible Muslim at the time, but I never even knew that that was a thing, I guess, back then, until 9-11, and we had our first um, incident of a Muslim girl post 9-11 um, who her headscarf got ripped off in the schoolyard, and it was us sort of processing the shift that we did not have before. migrant kids who get here and they and they get picked on they get bullied and stuff that's what you lose that's when you lose the child right when when you're picking on it children are supposed to be you should let children blossom you know but when you're picking on them about their skin about where they're from and all this sort of stuff they go inside of themselves and you lose that child and they, they won't talk to anybody and I, I went through a lot of that sort of stuff when I don't look at white people in the eye. The casual racism that is constantly put upon people of colour. Oh, jeez. You don't get burned in the sun, hey. <laughs> You're like, what? Like, I got a skin just like you and the sun is hot on anything and everything. <laughs> so just small things like that, um, they, people think that that doesn't hurt but it hurts a lot because it's um, it gets trapped in your, you, you constantly think about it. To start by acknowledging racism is real in Australia. It happens every single day and the impact are felt generationally, the impact are felt daily and it costs billions of dollars in the, the health impact for us who live with it. I think casual racism is the worst kind um, because when I know who my opponent is if I can see the person in front of me like if if it's the guy with the white sheet and the peeping holes then I know who I'm dealing with it's that casual racism that if nothing you walk away going did I overreact was I overthinking that did that really happen was it what I thought was it a misunderstanding and you're constantly in self-doubt and I think eventually that self-doubt plays its part in every other element of your life as well so it's sort of like you get a job and you're like, did I get it for on my, on my own merits or did I get it because I was wearing a headscarf? Um, did I earn that position or am I their token? And every panel or every discussion you get invited to, you're constantly questioning, why did I get a seat in that conversation? What was it based on? And, and I think it comes from this foundation of constantly questioning, did I just overreact?
Australia is going to be waves of people all the time. So if you if you successful in what you do, and you give back, and you help the next people, and you help the next people, and that's what I think why Australian is successful at multiculturalism. For me, I when I was 15, I copped a lot of races. Um, incidences and the one thing I remembered what I brought to that incident is forgiveness the opportunity to be able to forgive that person that's being racist to you um, and I didn't forgive them for them I forgave them for me so then that I don't have to constantly think about it because it's something that stays with you forever and it's it's the opportunity for me to forgive them so that they I can all obviously like maybe be a, a clearing for them to not go and do it to somebody else. But what I can tell you is that we can conquer racism because we're tough people. I went to a war, okay? Racism is just one more challenge. And to me, the heart of racism is this fear of the unknown, of people who are different, of people who we don't understand their ways and somehow. They, people have been taught that people like us somehow are just at the bottom of the barrel. We are not. You are not even just your race. You are more than just your race. That's one part of your identity. Don't let anybody box you in. You show up into the world how you want the world to see you. You show to the world what you have to offer. You show to the world the contribution you have. You show to the world that you have the right to exist as you are. To hell with the haters. All my little brothers and sisters out there, like when we say reach out, that's what we mean, reach out touch base, um, don't stop doing whatever you're doing. And if it is, you know, making life harder for you, it probably also means you're on the right path because nothing good comes easy. Coexistence with no resistance. I want to be waking up in the morning, watch sunrise or the morning show and see an Indian woman, an Asian woman, a Sassanese woman, a Fijian woman, an Australian woman, like actual representation of Australia. Like that's what I would love to wake up to. But as, as I've gotten older, I've seen how we just get put in corners and we get pushed to the side. Like, oh yeah, SBS will deal with that. That's not our problem, but it's like, no. That, that's that's not cool. We see it. <laughs> as a new migrant, as a refugee, and somebody who's found safety here, that I can be part of that journey and part of that movement to ensure that you know we are able to acknowledge the history of this nation, and then we work together or behind our first, the First Nation people, not our, but the First Nation people of this country, in leading us in where Australia needs to go because they know Australia better. This is their country. That is first and foremost what I would love to see. I want more representation um, because I know me the best. Um, you know, you know you, you the best. Um, we're the experts. Australia is precious, which is why we must continue to work better to make it safe for everyone who calls it home. <laughs>